Uh, Professor Misrahi and members of the Israeli Surgical Association, it's indeed a pleasure uh, for me to have uh, this uh, my second visit uh, to Israel and to talk about a subject for which I have had 40 years of investigative and uh, clinical interest, and that is the problem of surgical site infections. Now, the surgical site is bombarded with microorganisms. It has microorganisms that are contaminants from the environment of the operating room. It has contamination from the patient's skin. And it has contamination that is carried into the wound by our surgical activity. And then for selected operations that enter into highly colonized areas of the body, endogenous microflora become major causes of infection. It's not just, however, the numbers of bacteria that contaminate the wound, but it happens to be the virulence of the specific strains, the adjuvant effects that are present, things within the wound that amplify the virulence of the microorganisms. And the numerator of this equation is then offset by the effectiveness of the host defense mechanisms. And as all surgeons know, when the host is defective, infection ends up becoming a bigger player. Since the inception of surgery, the idea has been how can we prevent infections? And antisepsis began with Joseph Lister of actually using antiseptics to try to kill the microorganisms in the surgical environment. And then asepsis developed, developing a code of conduct infection control practices with gloves and drapes and a dedicated operating room theater to avoid organisms getting into contact with the patient. And then in the 1940s came the explosion of antibiotics and the expectation that the millennium of infection-free surgery was going to arrive. Well, the millennium has not arrived. And infection continues to be a major problem and we exercise a whole litany of different behaviors to try and prevent infection. And among those behaviors, preventive systemic antibiotics have been paramount. It started with the serendipitous identification of penicillin with, by Alexander Fleming the development of a host of different antimicrobial agents in the 1930s going into World War II. And coming out of the war, antibiotics became publicly available and patients received antibiotics for prevention. And William Altmeyer at the University of Cincinnati was a critical player in studying whether preventive antibiotics worked. And unfortunately, what he showed in a series of trials in the 1950s is that preventive antibiotics were ineffective. It was actually this marvelous uh, Englishman, a microbiologist, the director of the Lister Institute in London, in Sir Ashley Miles, who working with a U.S. Surgical Research Fellow in John Burke developed a skin model of studying the effects of antibiotics on emerging inflammation in the guinea pig skin. And what they demonstrated, if you follow this complex slide a little bit, is that if sensitive staphylococci were injected into the skin of the guinea pig, you would get a standard lesion at 24 hours time. And if you heat killed the staph, you only had a two or three millimeter foreign protein reaction 
at 24 to 48 hours. And if you gave antibiotics before the contamination, the antibiotics reduced the magnitude of the subsequent infectious lesion. And if you did not administer antibiotics to the guinea pig for a couple of hours after contamination, the antibiotics had no benefit. Well, those basic science observations were then interpreted by my mentor, Hiram Polk. Hiram did a sabbatical unknown to many people with Professor Miles in 1966 in London and came back to the U.S. convinced that he now knew why all of Altmaier's studies had failed. And they had failed because the antibiotics were not started until the patients were in the recovery room. So in a trial where the antibiotics were given before the incision, one could demonstrate great effectiveness in preventive antibiotics and reducing surgical site infection. Then a grand man of American surgery in Harlan Stone did an incredible forearm study that basically vindicated Professor Miles' guinea pigs, and that is, is that if you gave multiple doses of drugs preoperatively in the far right-hand column, it was no more beneficial than just giving the single dose immediately preoperatively. And if you didn't start the antibiotics until the patients were in the recovery room, there was no benefit whatsoever. Antibiotic has to be present in the wound at the time of contamination. And once the wound is closed, the patient's fate is sealed. Here's a study from Down Under in Australia, 25 different general surgery studies comparing a single preoperative dose against multiple doses and multiple days, and the results show no difference. The critical point is having drug when contamination occurs. And here's the famous study of Song and Glenny. Uh, from uh, the United Kingdom in colon surgery, and the same rules apply. The drug has to be present in the wound, and after wound closure, the patient's fate is sealed. An important concept that still no one seems to, very few people seem to understand or appreciate. The critical point being is that the organisms are lodged into a fibrin matrix during the operation and precipitated fibrin is virtually impervious to antibiotics. And then when we close the wound, there's a halo of edema that functionally makes the surgical interface ischemic. Systemic drugs after wound closure do not get there. So the drug has to be present at the time of contamination. It needs to be administered before the procedure. It's desirable to use long half-life drugs so that the drug persists. And in very long operations, I think a sound argument can be made for intraoperative redosing. The drug should have activity against the pathogens likely to be encountered, and continuation of the drug is not of any value. So, can long half-life drugs be given more than, shall we say, 60 minutes before the incision? And I think the evidence is yes, that as long as there's active drug, you can have biological activity. What about MRSA coverage? Now, I don't know about in Israel, but in the U.S. Community Associated Methicillin Resistant Staph Aureus is becoming a big problem. So should MRSA be covered 
for prophylaxis in 2013, particularly in clean operations. We have a huge population in the United States of patients coming from nursing homes, some 750,000 patients in nursing homes in the U.S., Nearly 500,000 people in the U.S. are on chronic renal dialysis, so they spend two hours or so three times per week in a healthcare environment receiving antibiotics. And then, of course, patients have recently been in the hospital. And so if a patient has had health care exposure, should our antibiotics be different? And is there a role for topical antibiotics? And many of these subjects have just not been covered. Here's a study which I believe is from Israel, if I'm not mistaken. An excellent study in an environment that was deemed to have relatively high MRSA colonization. And if you compared vancomycin to cepazolin, the results are amazing. If the patients had MRSA covered, they had the same infection rate as the cefazolin patients, but the difference is that if they had vancomycin, they had more methicillin-sensitive infections, and if they received cefazolin, they had more methicillin-resistant infections. And this has set the stage now for many people saying, that multiple drugs, perhaps, should be used in clean, high-risk operations where MRSA is a risk, but vancomycin does not cover the methicillin-sensitive organisms very well. Remains to be defined. Well, in the U.S., a sentinel event occurred in 1999 through 2001 when the Institute of Medicine came out with reports saying that physicians and surgeons are not adhering to medical evidence as well as they should. And they have, have proposed major changes in how health care was practiced. And to bring compliance with well-established evidence-based practice, several groups were put together, and I ended up being one of four surgeons working with epidemiologists and such in the National Surgical Infection Prevention Project. And the idea was to cut SSI rates in half by bringing compliance with the current evidence. And the evidence that was used were these three quality indicators that the antibiotic needed to be given within a 60 minute window before the incision, that an appropriate drug consistent with major societal recommendations be used, and thirdly, that the drug be stopped within 24 hours. And everybody agreed that these three made sense. And we then proceeded to do this study where we studied some 39,000 cases in the Medicare registry in the United States. And we basically found out that surgeons in the United States were really not paying attention to these three criteria that the antibiotics were not being consistently given within 60 minutes of the period before the incision. We generally were doing well in giving the right drug, but I would point out that colorectal surgery, which is something near and dear to my heart, had the poorest compliance. And then antibiotics, we just can't give them up. We give them forever more. And so only 40% of the patients had the drugs discontinued within 24 hours, and 10% of the patients received the drugs for more than four days. So then our federal government got involved and said, okay, surgeons and physicians, if you can't pay attention to it, then we will make you pay for it.
And so penalties have now been imposed if you don't report your compliance with national performance measures. And believe me, that has changed behavior. And the three performance measures that we innocently developed in the National Surgical Infection Prevention Project then became law. I never dreamed that I would be making law in the United States, but we did. And so the transition occurred from SIP to SKIP, and some of you, I think, are aware of the Surgical Care Improvement Project in the U.S., and we were going to make great strides in reducing preventable morbidity and mortality, and Prevention modules were created to prevent infections and cardiac events in DVT and pulmonary embolism and respiratory complications. And yes, all of our three criteria were there for antibiotics and then glucose control and proper hair removal. The federal government is now telling us how to remove hair in the operating room. This is uh, very interesting. And normothermia in cardiac patients. And there's now a level of government involvement that is interesting. But the question is, is have they made any difference? So the projects have been in place long enough, and the evidence isn't pretty. In fact... This study by Dr. Hahn showed that compliance with SKIP criteria for antibiotics made no difference. This study by jo Jonas Stolberg at Case Western in Cleveland, 405,000 cases, hospitals that complied did no better than those that didn't comply. This study from the University of Michigan, compliance with SKIP criteria made no difference. Dr. Hahn again in the VA study, compliance made no difference in SSI rates. And Dr. Davis from New Jersey actually showed that infection rates in the United States have actually gone up since the SKIP initiative. How is that for government intervention in medicine? Well, why has it failed? Are the performance measures invalid? Are there not enough? Are hospitals and physicians misrepresenting compliance? Is SSI preordained? It's sort of Calvinism applied to surgical care. Now, here in Israel, you probably don't recognize this figure. This man would be known to everybody in the U.S. This is Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was one of the big home run hitters of American baseball. But, you know, if you use his bat and you wear his jersey, you probably aren't going to hit home runs. <laughs> So compliance with performance measures in complex activity, like doing operations, may not make a difference, and that's what the data shows. The other thing is that government would make us believe that compliance with these things are measures of being good. But I say we should be measuring outcomes. We are not in synchronized swimming. It's not what the judges say, it's the outcome of what we do. So I would make the argument to you today that prevention of SSI requires the exercise of a whole detailed list of things that avoid infection. The density of the organisms, the local factors within the surgical site, are there things we can do to optimize the host?
And I think it's naive thinking in the U.S. or in Israel to believe that you could just manipulate one or two of these things and the world will be a better place. And I would argue that if one is tacky in the operating room relative to infection control practices, the systemic antibiotics are not going to make a difference. So to quote William Altmaier, one of the grand men of American surgery, the evidence clearly indicates that antibiotic therapy cannot be depended upon to prevent the development of local infection if established surgical principles or important technical details have been ignored. And I think we've been ignoring that. One of my great, the greatest quotations, one of the great ones of all time, is attributed to Louis Pasteur on his deathbed when he said, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. And there is no terrain quite like a surgical wound where there may be congealed blood and hemoglobin and dead tissue because someone used the electrocautery like a flamethrower <laughs> and braided suture material that harbors, harbors microorganisms and the dead space that now becomes a reservoir for inflammatory serum media and microbes and paying attention to those my friends is probably as important as any and all of the antibiotics that industry can make this is an old study by my good friend Wes Alexander who I am sure is known to many of you here it's 30 years old but the data shows that if you shave the hair the night before or even in the operating room and you create all of those nicks, scrapes, and crannies that then become colonized, it will increase infection rates and you should appropriately use electric clippers rather than using the straight razor. How about temperature control? This is a very interesting study keeping the body temperature as close to normal as possible. This prospective study of 200 patients shows that infection rates can be reduced by 70%. And part of the study that's not been talked about very much is look at the transfusion differences that almost approach statistical difference and transfusion is immunosuppressive. Much has been written about glucose control. You go back to the original study of just keeping it under 200 in heart cases. You can reduce sternal dehiscence. This is not a little drainage from the saphenous vein donor site. This is someone's sternum falling apart. And it makes a difference to keep the glucose reasonably controlled. It probably doesn't mean keeping it at 80 or 90 milligrams percent as we measure it in the U.S. And running the risk of hypoglycemia, but keeping it controlled is important. And then there's the issue of what should we do about the colon and that huge reservoir of microorganisms. This rectosigmoid colon has now been documented to have 10 to the 12th power microorganisms per gram of content. 10 to the 12th, ladies and gentlemen, that is 1 trillion microorganisms. As I like to say in the U.S., these are federal debt kind of figures, <laughs> to sort of put it into context. And are there things we can do? 
And 70 years ago, it was appreciated that mechanical preparation doesn't reduce SSI rates. Yes, 70 years ago, Edgar Poth published a whole series of papers saying it's not enough to try to purge the colon. It doesn't change the concentration. It simply reduces stool bulk. And recently in Europe, there's been this feeding frenzy of prospective studies showing that mechanical preparation by itself does not work. And from his grave, I am certain that Edgar Poth would agree that his research of 70 years ago remains valid. However, something has been lost in the interpretation of why mechanical preparation is worthwhile. It is only worthwhile when you include oral, poorly absorbed antibiotics in an appropriate way. And here's a study from the Mayo Clinic showing that if you add neomycin and tetracycline following mechanical bowel preparation, it has a tremendous benefit in reducing SSI rates. And Condon and Nichols replaced tetracycline with erythromycin base, and it too works, and it became very popular for a period of time in the 80s going into the 90s. And this study from Canada from my good friend Ron Lewis shows that if you use systemic antibiotics with the oral antibiotic bowel prep, it reduces SSI rates compared to systemic drugs by themselves. I think the evidence is clear, and here's a meta-analysis that I did that was published in the American Journal of Surgery, and the p-value is 0001 that if you use appropriate systemic antibiotics with the oral antibiotic bowel prep, that you get the best possible outcomes. But controversial issues remain. Should you scrub the surgical site with chlorhexidine? Remains of uncertain value. Should you preoperatively have patients bathing and showering with antiseptics? The data would indicate that may not be true. In my home state, the state government is now requires now requires that all patients have to have nasal cultures to screen for MRSA when they go into the hospital. But nobody has an idea as to what to do with it if it's positive. <laughs> it's a true example of the clueless leading those who don't really know what the answer is. N nutritional support, I see we're going to have some discussion about that, and I certainly welcome it, because there is no mistake that preoperative hypoalbuminemia is a significant event. What about skin preparation before the incision? Here's some evidence to show the chlorhexidine with isopropyl alcohol would appear to be superior to using povidone iodine. We need more studies like this. But my point is I'm showing you there's a whole litany of things that have to be done if we're going to reduce SSI rates. You can't just pick one. Delayed primary closure. When do you choose secondary closure? When do you put a wound vac on? When should you use suction drains? Should you use adhesive drapes before the incision is made? Do postoperative wound dressings make any difference? The number of variables is huge. So to paraphrase Paul Simon, with all due respect to his 
50 ways to dissolve domestic relationships. <laughs> there are 50 ways and more that account for why a surgical site infection might occur. I was concerned, Professor Mazmaris Mazzoli, <laughs> that maybe you hadn't heard of Paul Simon, because I gave grand rounds at Northwestern and the residents never heard of him, but I was relieved last night when the young lady sang Scarborough Fair to introduce the program, and perhaps Israel had heard of Paul Simon as well. But I can give you lists of things that have been associated with causing infection, and each one of them probably requires a preventive measure. And if you lapse in any of them, you may pay the consequence, regardless of the antibiotics that you use. So, Paul Simon, don't use the straight razor, Dave. Don't have an intraoperative spill, Phil. Don't leave any dead space grace. You'll notice I'm covering the gender gap here, too. No preoperative cigarettes, Yvette. Use the chlorhexidine, Nadine. Don't let them get cold, Harold. Take it easy with the bovie, Toby. And have a preoperative antibiotic plan stand to get yourself free of pus. So process measures have become the surrogate for quality performance, and I think that's not good. Current process measures are scientifically valid, but they are functioning in a vacuum, and they fail when technical principles and when infection control practices are substandard. SSI occurs because of a complex interaction of bacteria, the local conditions of the surgical site, and the integrity of the host. Quality assessment in surgical care only is going to come from the objective measurement of outcomes. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Don.